let's dive into into your book. Uh, I mean, how early did you had how early did you get the idea of writing it, and what set you off to actually say, okay, I'm going to write this book? Uh, a little bit serendipity. Uh, so at the FT, you know, we not we don't have as many journalists at the Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg. So you have to kind of be focused. Focus is really important in a lot of jobs, but I think especially with journalism, where just by the nature of the beasts, you're always flitting from one subject to the next. So you have to focus on what the big stories are and just own them, really do well in them. And for me, when I was sort of leading the financial coverage in New York, as so I was the US markets editor, um, the rise of passive investing index funds was clearly and obviously one of the biggest, if not the biggest trend that was reshaping financial markets, investment bank trading desks, the investment industry, hedge funds, and so on. It was a topic that everybody had views on. And I just thought that's a great topic. So I threw myself into learning as much about it as possible and, and writing a lot about that. After a few years of doing this, I decided I wanted to really get stuck into the, the origin story of index funds. Um, and, you know, partially because I was a history buff, but I thought there could be a good story there. Because sometimes, you know, you start a story, start researching something, and it's really boring, or it just doesn't work, you can't structure it right. But luckily, the people that invented index funds were really cool, interesting people. So suddenly you had the combination of like an important story and an interesting story. So you put those two together, you've got hopefully at least a very good article. So I wrote a magazine piece for the FT um, magazine, Weekend Magazine, long, it's a 4,000 word piece on the history of index funds and how they're changing everything essentially. And as I was writing, I did think, you know, actually this, this is, my article is quite good. I'm quite critical. Quite a lot of stuff I hate that I write, I end up hating very quickly. But I thought this was interesting and good. This might even be a book. And as it happens, out of the blue, I got called by my agent now, uh, Julia, who said, hey, this would make a great book. Can I sell it for you, please? And I said, yeah, go ahead. And she basically took it around to some big publishers in the US, uh, managed to get several bids. And, uh, you know, I went with Penguin. And uh, again, shows a bit of luck. I might have written a book anyway but julia emailing me at exactly the right time and then selling the book just as publishers were thinking this is maybe something we should publish something on was just you know blind luck i mean it's a people-driven book so can you please introduce those pioneers and tell us something about about them yes i try to do as much about people as possible partially because it's almost a, a gimmick of journalism in that like, people like reading about other people. So you can kind of explain more complex subjects through the prism of people. Sometimes it can be forced, but in this case, I just didn't have to because the characters were really interesting. Uh, I mean, I start the story of indexing with um, one of my favorite characters, which was Louis Bacalier. And he's one of my favorites because he basically died a nobody. And I love some stories. I mean, they're quite tragic, but people that essentially died in obscurity, were never appreciated in their own time, but were later recognized as giants of their field. And Bacalier is today known as the father of financial economics. And a lot of the work that he did on how stocks seem to move randomly is the wellspring from which index funds eventually, many, many decades later, sprung. So his work was then picked up by you know, more famously people like Gene Farmer, who turned the random walk theory into a sort of full-blown theory for how markets function, the efficient markets hypothesis, which is controversial just because everybody can see stupid stuff happen in markets all the time, both on individual stocks day-to-day -day basis or just in the fullness of time that, you know, the financial crisis or meme stocks or, you know, Tesla today maybe. Um, so people often like to bash the efficient markets theory, ignoring firstly that, Farmer has done seminal work on the fat tail risks of markets. Like he, he has shown how markets do tend to move kind of irrationally as well in the short run and sometimes in the long run. The distribution is non-normal in the economics jargon. But also because models are just a yet helpful tool. So uh, there's a statistician called George Box who once said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think the efficient markets theory is a perfect example of that, that 
you can find tons of faults with it. It's probably wrong in a classic sense that markets aren't perfectly efficient or even semi-efficient, but it's a good enough guide to explain how markets function in that prices continue to reflect all known information and misinformation for that matter. Uh, and that keep, keep getting baked into the price. And at any given time, the price of a security is roughly where an equal number of buy and sellers think is fair. And it's very hard, therefore, to beat in the long run. So both explained how market pricing kind of works, but also why maybe it might be a good idea to just buy or create a fund that buys all the stocks in the market rather than just try to expensively buy just the hot ones, the ones that you think are going to be hot. At this time, I think you say in the book, it's it was a very un-American idea, like to kind of make people understand how disruptive the idea was. Can you tell us a bit about the feedback the guys were getting at the start, at least? Well, it was a mix of howls of derision, mockery, scorn, and a little bit of anger. But frankly, like in the beginning, the idea was so outlandish that the industry really didn't care that much. Uh so I think it's it's definitely sort of antithetical to how Americans see themselves, but kind of antithetical to human nature, right? We all want to do better. Nobody wants to be a mediocre journalist. Nobody wants to be a mediocre podcast. Nobody wants to be a mediocre surgeon. Nobody wants to be a mediocre dustbin cleaner, right? We want to be better at what we do. It's kind of why humans have managed to crawl out of the mud and do what we've done. Uh, and it's certainly in America, like the idea of like being the best uh, is just very heavily ingrained. And embracing mediocrity, as index funds were sort of called, it wasn't just seen as lazy, it was seen as un-American. And people even printed up posters saying, stamp out index funds, they are un-American. Um, but at the beginning, people just didn't think this would ever be able to be sold. And of course, it took many decades for ordinary people to sort of cotton onto this big secret that actually most active managers do a really poor job and cost a lot of money. It was no coincidence that it was the more sophisticated investors, primarily some of the really big US pension plans that were the first people to bankroll the very first index funds. This was an institutional game, not an ordinary retail investor game. Because they could see, this is typically the different pension plans of the split up AT&T monopoly. It used to be a monopoly, it was split up into some different parts, uh, all called baby bells. Um, they could see, they were exchanging notes and they could see, look, you've invested in 50 fund managers, we've invested in 50 fund managers. And all these guys are doing is essentially swapping IBM stock or GM stock or, or Xerox stock and doing a really bad job and costing a lot of money in trading costs because trading costs were astronomical at, at the time. So overall, we're just basically hiring, as I think somebody said, hiring a bunch of monkeys that are just swapping bananas all day long and taking charging a lot of money. How about we just index? So that's how it started. Uh, but it took many decades before it really sort of erupted into and became a phenomenon. Mm -hmm.